Rudy, thank you for being here today. This Rudy and Trey are guests of ours today. Darren is out of town with a great job. It is, uh, it's neat how God works things out. I won't go into too long in detail, but you know, like 12 years ago, I'm at Alto Frio running a you know, computer for you know youth retreat. And next to me is this weird guy who was running sound and uh, come to just love this guy, love his heart, love his character. And we end up hiring him as our, our media director. And so then Craig comes in and we're like, hey, we need some worship guys. And so he's like, I got contacts. And so Rudy and Trey are his buddies. And so blessed to, to see how things, you know, God works things and just, he knows what he's doing years in advance. He knows how he's bringing things together. And sometimes we we just kind of get confused in the moment. And I appreciate John Stotzenberger preaching last week. John's one of our church members. He's pastored before. Um, I just watched online when I had a chance on Sunday after uh, my traveling and listened to the message and he did a great job. Appreciate his, his obedience and willingness to do this. He, I, I thought about changing something. He did this last week and I thought, man, I kind of look good. And I thought, no, I need something to stand behind. Um, so I, I'm just gonna leave it right here. I thought about it, but you know, um, but today we're in Exodus chapter 19 and 20. We're setting the stage for um, God's really kind of giving some order here. So he's heard the cry of his people. He has brought the plagues, got their attention, showed Egypt and Israel, his power, his might, his capabilities. He's delivered them out of Pharaoh's rule, crossed the Red Sea, destroyed Pharaoh and his, his regime and all his armies coming after them. He's now on this side of the Red Sea and they're kind of camping out in the wilderness right near Mount Sinai. And we pick up in 19, chapter 19, where Moses encounters God and God's began to speak to Moses about, this is what it takes. You, this, you're my people. Now these are the rules of, of living in my house, basically kind of a thing. And this is actually for several chapters, he begins to speak these things. And then we pick up on kind of how Israel responds to that um, later. But in 19, uh, one and two, we see Israel camping outside the base of Mount Sinai in the wilderness. Uh, verse three, Moses goes up to the mountain to meet with God. Now, let's just take a moment and kind of take that in for a second. Moses met with God. He calls him up and says, in verse three, he says, um, while Moses went up to God, the Lord called out to him of the mountain saying, thus you'll still say to the house of Jacob and tell my people of Israel. So he's going to meet God. Now, I don't know about you, but first time he encountered God, you know, the, his, the burning bush experience, you know, and then he's talking with him on a regular basis, but now he's setting up a time to go and meet him. What a, I'm thinking, how, what a cool meeting. Like, I remember like on my first date with, with Tanya, we were, we were dating and uh, so we, we liked each other, we saw each other, we've had a couple of encounters, but now we're gonna go on a date. It's a little different now. This is an appointed meeting. You know, you brush your teeth, you know, put on deodorant, you know, make sure your clothes are ironed, things like that. Like, I'm getting excited, like this is gonna be a great time. I've been around her before, but now we have a date. We have an appointment made to be with one another. And so I see Moses kind of going, okay, well, here we are. And God's like, come on up, we need to talk. It's like, oh my gosh, I get to go meet with God. I get to go listen to him talk and tell me these things. Like I can just imagine Moses being like, you know, make sure his, you know, his robes are ironed and you know, those kinds of things, getting ready for this encounter. Verse four through six, God tells Moses that you saw how mighty he, that he was. And they so if they would obeyed his voice, then they shall become a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. He said, listen, you saw how strong I was. You saw how mighty I am. If you will obey me, this is what I will do. Now, he's not doing what we as since his father's day, I'll pick on us dads. So what we do sometimes, we're like, hey, listen, if you will clean your room, I'll take you out for ice cream. I'm gonna leverage the ice cream for the room cleaning. God's not leveraging things for obedience, but he's letting you know by obeying me, this is a reward. By doing what I've called you to do, Here's the reward. He's not leveraging things for obedience, but he's giving obedience of promise. Verses seven through eight, where Moses reports this to the message to the people, what God said he'd do if they obey him. And they say, we'll do whatever he says. I mean, the blessing was so great to be a, a nation of priests and a, a holy nation. The, the blessing was so great. They said, we'll do whatever he says. It's almost like your kids saying, hey, here's the deal. Today, a matter of fact, for this next week, if, everything goes according to plan and you listen to mom and do what you're asked to do, 
we're going to Disney World. You go do whatever mom says. I mean, kids will be like, it doesn't matter what mom says, I wanna to go to Disney World, I'll do whatever she says because the reward is so great. The nation of Israel is like, to be a nation of priests, a holy nation. If that's what God has for us out of our obedience, I'll do whatever he wants. They don't even know what the whatever is yet, but he says, whatever. Verse nine through 13, God says he'll come back in a thick cloud and the people can hear God talking to Moses, but they can't go up the mountain. They can only go to the edge of it or they would die. I kind of, you know, later on, we'll get to this verse that says that they, they tell Moses, hey, you talk to God because if God talks directly to us, we'll probably die. But here this says they go to the mountain that they, God says, they'll hear my voice. I kind of picture it like, not that God's in argue, arguing with Moses, but parents, you ever, you know, gone to your bedroom to shut the door and argue so your kids wouldn't hear? Only to find out when you walked out of the bedroom, all the kids are sitting on the couch like this. Because not that they, don't, they didn't know what, they don't know all the words that were being said, but they, they heard mom and dad talking and they heard their name a couple of times. They're like, that was your name. They're like, I know, you know, like it was straightened up kind of a thing. Like they could hear God talking to Moses. And they were like, uh, later on, they're like, we heard God talking. I tell you what, you just tell us what he says. Cause I bet if he talks directly to me, I'll die. And so we find out here in verse uh, 16, through, 16 through 20 of chapter 19, Moses brought the people out of the camp to the base of the mountain and the whole place was filled and wrapped with smoke because the Lord came down and fire on top of the mountain and called Moses to the top. Can you imagine what this would look like? Sitting at the base of the mountain, completely engulfed in smoke, fires coming down on top of the mountain. And then they're like, Moses, come on up here. It's a scary moment. I mean, Okay, I'm gonna follow what God, whatever he says, even if it means going up a smoke-filled mountain that has fire coming down from heaven on it. I, I'm gonna go up there. Verse 21 through 25, God tells Moses to go back down the mountain and warn everyone not to break through or they'll die. And for the priests to consecrate themselves and finally get Aaron and bring him back up with you. Moses must've been in pretty good shape. I'd be out, the, the, the text does not say this, but I'd be out of breath. I go up the mountain to meet with God. God sends me back down the mountain. I tell her about this, get Aaron. I go back up the mountain. I mean, I'm like, I'm wore out. A lot of mountain going on here. So, but going on verses chapter 20, verses one, two, one and two, God reminded them who he was and what he had done for them. And John talked about that last week. We need to remind ourselves that we need to be reminded of what God has done. And we need to be reminded and God is quick to remind them who he is and what he's done for them. Verses three through 17, we see the 10 commandments uh, listed here for the first time in scripture. Verse 18 of chapter 20, uh, God's people were afraid of the presence of God. They backed up and they said, you tell us what God says because if we speak directly to him, we'll die. Verse 22 to 23, God tells Moses to tell the people to, to not use your gold or your silver to make idols. It's a big thing, we'll get into this later on, but he did not want them to revert to a type of worship that they had witnessed and been a part of while they were um, over in Egypt. When they saw other people worship other gods and they, they would see the idol worship. And when I say participate, I don't mean like engage in it, but like you observed it kind of thing. They did not want them to engage in their relationship with their God as they had seen the Egyptians engage and worship to their God. So all the silver and the gold they had plundered that the Egyptians said, yeah, here you go, have it. And they're like, sweet, thanks. He said, don't turn that into an idol. And then we find out here in verses 24 and 26, God tells Moses to construct an altar, but he does not want the stones to be cut or designed, and he doesn't want any steps going up to it. He's very specific on what this altar should look like and why it should look like those things. So what's your takeaway? If you have your bulletin on the back of it, we got three things we wanna talk about this morning. Verse chapter 19, seven through eight says, so Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. 
And the Lord said to most, behold, I'm coming to you in a thick cloud of people that you may hear when I speak to you, you may also believe and forever. First thing is this, I want you to know there are blessings associated with obedience. There are blessings associated with obedience. Well, what was the blessing here? They said, we'll do whatever you want. We will obey you. But what was the blessing? The blessing is actually found in five and six. We said earlier, now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasure possession among all the people for all the earth is mine. And you shall be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to Israel. There are blessings associated with obedience. Think about our families. Moms, dads, when you see your kids doing things in a, in a selfless manner, don't, aren't you quick to reward that? Aren't you quick to praise that? I have a, thing, a sign in my office that says, you know, you know what, I, what am I praying about the most and what am I praising about the most? What am, what am I excited about the most? What am I you know, rewarding you know, for you know, behavior? Whether, you know, my family, like, am I seeing things in my family, things in my life and, that are of God and, say, and, and reward those things? There's blessings associated with obedience. Now, we don't do things to get things, okay? We don't want this, we gotta kind of get that over our head. We're not like, it's not this game we play. Like God says this, okay, look, I did that. Where's my money? Where's my $5? Look, I clean my room. Where's my ice cream? It's not how this works. But we do know that there's a blessing aside with uh, obedience. Jesus says, Luke chapter 11, 28, blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. One of the Beatitudes, blessed are the ones who hear the word of God and obey it. If blessing is associated with obedience, then maybe we should change our prayer from praying for blessings and start praying for obedience. So isn't that what we mostly do? With the, the things that God blesses us according to his sovereign will, those are the things we're praying for. Lord, if you'll just give me a, a, a raise here, if you'll give me this new job here, if you'll, if you'll just fix this relationship here, if you'll just do this, you'll do all these things. Those are the blessings of God instead. And we're not praying for perseverance to endure the relationship. We're not praying for wisdom, how to have a counsel. We're not praying for discernment, how to walk in it. We need, not, we need to stop praying for the blessings of God and say, hey, just give me these things and praying for the obedience that we'll be able to walk these things so that in our obedience, God can bless us how he chooses. For some, that can be easier said than done because when praying for how, what God leads you to do and what God wants you to do, there's a lot of Christians out there who don't know God's voice. They don't know if it's God speaking or is it the Taco Bell they had the night before? Is this God or is this my gut? And how do I understand between? There's a lot of a lot of Christians. So a little selfish plug in August, when we finish the series in Exodus, we're gonna do a four or five week series called Listening to God. I really believe it's gonna be transformational for a lot of us in how we learn to listen to God, but the importance and the responsibility of listening to God, it's not just for information. It's like reading a book, be like, ah, I have finished that. On to the next. There's, there's a requirement in listening to God's voice. And we'll look at more in depth in that series, what that looks like. But some of us would struggle and say, okay, so if, I, if, I, if I'm praying not for God to give me certain things, but I'm praying for opportunities to be obedient to him, trusting those things, how do I know that what, what God wants for me? How do I know what God is speaking to me? I know that that can be more difficult. A little, just a quick answer to that is seek counsel and seek the word. Find someone who will partner with you in praying about this. Ask them to go and seek the word and be like, is what, this is what God wants you to do. And do we see that lined up with the scripture and ask them to pray with you about it. But my encouragement to us is since we know that blessings are associated with obedience, let's just start praying for obedience in our lives than just the blessings itself. Now, when we look through these things, there's a lot of times we'll need to kind of stay, take a step back and maybe as John Stotzenberger told us last week, we need to remember. In order to know our next step is we need to remember what God has done. Sometimes looking back helps us know what, steps to take forward. I don't know, for me, a lot of times I need some direction in my life. I look back at what God has already done. What God has, what is, where has he led me so far to this point? 
I'm trying to look forward, but sometimes it's helpful to kind of look back and go, okay, look, the trail looks like it's going right through here. Not always, but a lot of the times it's very helpful. And the other thing is, since I know that blessings are associated with obedience, I look back on those things in my life that are most obedience and I'm reminded of the, the old hymn, count your many blessings. The first hymn says, the first verse says, when upon life's billows you are tempest tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. So a lot of times for us, we get so distracted on what God is doing and will he do this? And then where's this blessing here? And we just need to be obedient. And some of the best ways for us to remain steadfast in obedience is to remember what God has already done in our life and how we responded to his work in our lives. The second thing I want you guys to know is be willing to say yes without knowing all the details. Now, I know that is very difficult for, well, I, every one of us, myself included. To be willing to say yes without knowing the details. It is pretty scary for us because we always, we wanna know. You've got that friend that calls you up and says, hey, what are you doing Saturday? Depends on the friend, right? You're like, I, I don't know. What, what are you thinking about? Because you know, last time they called you up, you found yourself mulching in their flower bed for three and a half hours and that's not how you wanted to spend your Saturday. They're like, I just figured you'd come over and we'd have, you know, some barbecue, eat some lunch, that kind of stuff. And, you know, maybe you can show me a couple things in the flower bed. Next, you know, three and a half hours later, you're knee deep in mulch. You're like, this is not how I plan to spend my Saturday. So the next time they call you up and says, what are you doing on Saturday? You're a little timid to go, because you want to know. You want to know what, is, what it's going to be. Last time you called me up, we, we jumped on a plane and headed up to Denver and went snowboarding for the day. And so maybe I'm a little more quick to say, yeah, let's do this thing. If any of those, I want to be your friend real quick. But, uh, you know, we, the people of Israel here, he said, this is what the blessing is. But in order to receive this, this you have to be obedient. And they said, whatever it means, whatever it takes, we'll be obedient. Because they understood what the reward was. Church, we lose sight of that. We lose sight of what the reward is and obedience in Christ. And so we spend most of our time to argue with God going, well, what is, how much is it gonna cost me? How long is this gonna take? How, how, long, how long do I have to serve on this committee? How long do I have to, we, when we start asking all these questions before we just commit to say, yes, Lord. And I just wanna encourage all of us when it comes to our faithfulness and our walk with the Lord, we need to be willing to say yes without knowing all the details because here's what we do know. The moment we have find one thing that kind of disrupts our schedule, we're gonna cast off our strength. And we're gonna be like, nope, sorry, can't do it. Or we're gonna to try to convince God that he probably missed this little mark and there's a better way to do it. And the truth is, is when we do that, when we question God, it's really out of, it's a, out of a lack of trust. When God says, hey, I need you to serve on this team. Or I need you to do this. Or I need you to step out in this area. And we're like, well, what does it really look like? What we're really saying is, I don't trust you, God. Because when that friend calls us up, they're like, what are you doing Saturday? And we're like, what do you got in mind? Because what? We don't trust them. It doesn't mean we don't love them. We don't care for them. They're not our friends, but we don't trust them. And so when we are hesitant to the will of God, it is because we don't trust him. We look back at God's faithfulness and we say, when, when has God ever failed us? When has God ever gotten it wrong? And even in those moments where we look at like, all was at loss and we look back at that years later, we look how God's hand was very much right in the middle of it. You may be walking through a storm in your life and you're thinking, this is just chaos. God, where are you? Because all you can see is this month. All you can see is this day or this hour. And God's like, hey, in 10 years, you're gonna look back at this and you're gonna sing praises to my name because you're gonna fully understand what I was accomplishing. Church, myself included, what would it look like if in our families, we were willing to say yes without reservation to the will of God and for seven days? What would it look like in our families right now from our youngest to the parents if that family just said, Yes, Lord. That was the response, yes, Lord. What would be the tone changed in the home? 
transfer that into our church. What would it look like if all of us who are gathered here, not those who are on the membership role, but just who are gathered here in person and online, we said, for seven days, we're gonna say yes to the will of God without any hesitation. Here's why I can tell you the first thing would be a result of that. There'd be more people here next week than there were this week. Because there's people we encounter who don't know Jesus, people who are, are searching, and we've had conversations with them, but we've never really invited them to church. I, I was encouraged this, uh, last week, I got a, uh, a phone call from my, my buddy Sam, and he was like, hey, guess what? So I was at CVS printing out VBS pictures, and this lady's like, hey, I like your shirt. He's like, awesome, he's wearing his VBS shirt from this year. Getting printer, pictures printed out for VBS, the guy, you know, Sam just ends up talking to the lady, inviting her to church, and you know, hey, here's this, here's this, you know, happened to him like twice in the last two weeks. Just everyday conversation, just, hey, God's changed my life, and I get to have a random conversation with somebody at HB or at CVS printing photos, and I'm just gonna share my love for my church and my God. I promise you, if everyone did that just without any like relationships being stored, people getting saved, like just an immediate physically with the eye could see is there will be twice as many people here next week as there are this week. If we just said, yes, Lord. And I'm not after like trying to get numbers. That's not where I'm after, but, but there's a lot of times that God speaks to us and we just kind of step back because we're, we're scared. We don't know what this entails. We don't feel qualified. We don't feel equipped. And really what we're saying, God, is I don't really trust you because I can't do that, and why would you ask me to do that? And we haven't worked out the problems. I just wanna encourage you, church. There's a blessing associated with your obedience. Just say yes. And I'm talking to myself today too. Now here we, in chapter 21 through 17, we see the 10 commandments show up. We talk about keeping God first, worship God only, <clears throat> don't misuse God's name. Now a little side note here, church. Not, not using the Lord's name in vain is not about cursing, okay? So just letting you know, like, out of all the things that we're talking about, God's not just talking about, you know, hey, make sure you, you, you keep a wholesome language. I like to look at this and say, don't take the Lord's name in vain as a Christian, as a Christ follower. Am I misrepresenting who I am in the pulpit, in my home, on a ball field, at a line at H-E-B? <clears throat> Am I misusing the Lord's name? Did I take on the, the image of Christ and walk out in public and take it in vain? Just a side note there. Rest and keep the Sabbath holy. Obey your parents. Don't murder, don't hurt people. Keep your wedding promises. Don't steal, tell the truth, and don't wish for others' stuff. Just a couple of things here. The Ten Commandments are never listed in the Bible as the Ten Commandments. The, the Bible never refers to them as the Ten Commandments. We get that from the heading in our Bibles and the, there's 10 of them and they're commands from God, but the scripture actually doesn't indicate them as the Ten Commandments. Here's, now I'm not advocating that we change them or anything like that, I'm just a little side note in, in study. I was like, that's interesting. I never thought about that. I thought they did say Ten Commandments and it's just a, a, a title on the heading on the Bibles. But the Ten Commandments, they show us who God is and how much he really cares about us. They don't take away our freedom, they actually provide freedom for us. And they show us how we can, we, that we can't keep these things perfect. And there's absolutely a need to someone to come alongside of us who can do these things to equip us in carrying out these things. And the, John talks about the Holy Spirit coming and living inside of us to instruct us, to counsel us, a paraclete. And so the 10 commandments do those things and much more. In chapter 20, verse 22 and 23, it says, and the Lord said to Moses, thus you shall say to the people of Israel, you have seen for yourselves that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make gods of silver to be with me, nor shall you make for yourselves gods of gold. The last thing you're filling in your bulletin is this. God is here. God is here. God has taken the nation of Israel out of slavery. He's delivered them from Pharaoh. And now he has given them marching orders of what it means to carry out, to be obedient to what he said. But God did not want them to make idols of him. 
because he was there. See, in, in Egypt, these gods that they had, they were distant. They were either make believe or whatever you want to believe about them, but they had this idol as a representation because that God was not with them. He, said, he clearly says it here. You have seen for yourselves that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make gods of silver to be with me. You don't need this thing to be with me. You don't need a good luck charm. I always get tickled at people who are like, oh, this is, you know, you know, this is this, and this, you know, this is what brings me closer to God. And it's this, this painting, this picture. I know when we go to Ecuador, you know, and, and on these businesses, they've got all these, uh, you know, paintings and pictures, and that brings them peace or brings them joy. Or it wards off the bad enemies. I'm like, he's like, you don't need those things to be near me. I'm with you. You've heard me talk. This last week, my family, I was on vacation. Caleb and I went to Arkansas. He had a college tryout and we went there and we went fishing, you know, almost every day we were up there, we had a blast. My daughter and my wife were at a softball camp and then at a, at a, at a tournament and my son was locked down at Fort Sam Houston except for on the weekends. And so it's funny when we're separate as a family, you know, our text messages, they go from, what are we having for lunch? Hey, what time are you gonna be home? Are you calling a game tonight? It's, send me a picture, send me a picture. I'm sure my son, when he's on, on the base, once he got his phone back to him, and I know Dylan just got out of uh, his training in, with uh, the 68 whiskeys, mom's always asking for pictures. Why? Because you're not near him. I see my, my daughter and my wife, and I'm like, send me a picture. This is, this is me in the hot sun, sweating at a softball game. I'm like, you look beautiful, I love you. Why? Because I can't embrace her. I, when she's, she didn't go to one of Caleb's tournaments because she was at a tournament with Abby and she's like, send me a picture. And I sent her one. I sent the wrong one. She's copied Tony Jester's Facebook profile. Like, no, I need a picture like this. So I had to take a picture of Caleb like this because she couldn't be there because she couldn't put her arms around her own son. So she's like, I need a picture of you. I, I can't be there to hold you, to touch you, to kiss you, to hug you. So I need a representation of you. Send me a picture. I haven't seen my wife or my daughter in seven days because they've been running around. Caleb and I've been running around. And all of a sudden, the text message, the family threads got picture after picture after picture, intermixed with some gifts and some TikTok videos, but mainly picture after picture because we weren't physically with each other. God says, you don't need a representation of me because I'm with you. I'm here. You've heard my voice. You've seen me deliver you. You've seen my power. You've seen my might. Don't take the gold. Don't take the silver and make anything to be with me. I am with you already. My wife has never looked at me and says, and on the couch says, hey, can you send me a picture of you real quick? I'm right here. Oh, that's right. Can you scoot over closer? She's never asked me to send her a picture of us when we're together because we're with each other. Church, I want you to know that God is here. God is with you. And he has a specific plan for you to carry out. And there's a blessing associated with your obedience to that plan. But don't get caught up in knowing all the details and following his way. He is with you every step of the way. I'd rather be lost on my journey trying to obey God, knowing he's with me then stand still and miss out on what God has in store for me because I didn't like what it was or because I questioned it or because I didn't understand it. I tell people all the time, God can't steer a parked car. You get in any one of your cars today and start the car and start turning your wheel and look over your rear view mirror and start doing this all you want. And guess where you'll be? Right where you are. You can turn all sorts of directions, but if you stay in park, you stay right there. But yet, as the moment we step out on faith and we start trusting God, we might take a couple steps in the wrong direction, but you know what we can do? We can change directions because we're not in park. I'd rather take the wrong step trying to obey God than to sit in park all day long and miss out all he wants to do in my life. And that's kind of what I've adopted my, for my own personal life and it serves me well because it keeps me attentive to the voice of God. 
Left, right, slow down, speed up, where am I at? Because I don't know where I'm going. You ever been in a car like that? You're driving, but they know where you're going. So you have to listen to the directions a little closer. Turn down the radio, roll down the windows, make sure you can see clearly. Church, I get it, this journey that God has us on can be scary, it can be difficult, it can be uncertain at times, but I want you to know that there's a blessing associated with obedience. Trust him, he's never failed us and he won't fail us. He, it goes against his nature to fail his people. And the last thing is, he's with you. You don't need a representation of him. He's right there with you every step of the way. Let's stand to our feet and we'll close in a word of prayer. God, thank you so much that sometimes our journey is lonely. Sometimes it's scary. Sometimes it's even confusing. but help us trust you. You know what is best. And you know our tendency to wander and to, and to escape at times because of our fears. You told the people of Israel the very first thing before speaking to them is don't make any idols because I'm with you. God, you know where we kind of drift and where we wander. Help us know that you're with us and we don't need any other comfort or resource than you. Help us trust you this week as we walk in obedience for whatever that may be. Let's step out in obedience and trust you. God, equip us and enable us this week to carry out your will. Give us the perseverance and the strength and the humility to walk in your will this week. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Hey, before you leave, just a couple of things. We'll be down here at front. We got a couple of deacons and myself and some staff members. We would love to talk with you, pray with you, hear how God is working in your life, some questions you may have. The other thing is if you're a guest with us on your bulletin, you'll tear that out at the next steps table and you walk out those doors to my left, probably your right shoulder. There'll be a deacon at the table. We've got something for you. We wanna say thank you for being here with you. Buy your lunch at Chick-fil-A. And uh, if we can serve you, love you in any way, please let us know. Have a blessed week and walk in obedience.